to the town hall we're going to have uh, starting now on realizing pathways to discovery, a town hall on community activities to realize Astro 2020's astrobiology goals. Um, and I'm proud to say that, you know, there was a planetary and astrobiology decadal survey that just came out, was released last month. But I am now fondly thinking of the astrophysics decadal survey as also the astrophysics and astrobiology decadal survey, because there certainly were uh, multiple astrobiology goals in that report. Um, and we're going to hear from Paul Hertz, who's the director of the astrophysics division, of next steps for, uh, for, for implementing and uh, a strategy to realize those goals uh, from NASA's side. Uh, that'll be followed by people speaking from other NASA uh, and NASA affiliated community groups, um, telling you what they have planned or might be capable of doing. And then we'll end with a chance for all of you to give us feedback on things that you think we can or should be doing um, or questions you might have about the activities. Um, and with that, I, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul Hertz. Uh, he's gonna share remotely and uh, tell you what APD, the Astrophysics Division at NASA has planned. All right, thank you very much, Sean. And I uh, hope that I'm now sharing correctly. I see your slides then. Confirm that. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, speak remotely at this uh, town hall. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's great to be talking to the astrobiology community um, since astrobiology is such an important part of astrophysics nowadays. Um, Paul, you know, at um, NASA, one moment. Yeah. Um, we're not seeing full screen, so can you um, maybe swap displays on your slideshow? Or I have, I, I have no idea how to do that. I'm on a PC. There's no swap screen so, option available for me. So up on the top, the slideshow menu? Um, okay. And um, if you want to go full screen, the, uh -huh. the icon at the bottom. I went. Oh. Wait, wait, just hit from yeah, beginning did... at the top right. Okay. Top left. That's sorry. where I was. That's where I started. So now that's what I've done. But you're seeing the presenter mode, I assume. Oh. Interesting. No. Right. So um, you can swap displays. Can I get a thumbs up from audience members if you can see Paul's slides okay, even in this mode? Maybe folks in the back. Okay, Paul, we got some thumbs up. It looks like you're okay if you're comfortable presenting this way. It looks perfect to me. I'm, I don't know how to swap screens. I've got the one I want you guys to be seeing. So, so I apologize. Um, some of us are not IT wizards. So uh, the astrophysics portfolio um, includes a, uh, a broad range of space telescopes that operate across the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we have uh, a portfolio of missions in operations. The blue ones in development uh, are missions, including uh, in, in the blue, of course, we just launched the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be the next great uh, exoplanet mission. One of the uh, key areas of science for James Webb will be interrogating the atmospheres of exoplanets around nearby stars through the transit spectroscopy method. Um, and searching for, um, well, helping us to understand the physics of exoplanet atmospheres and uh, searching for um, biosignatures in habitable zone uh, exoplanets. Um, in, in yellow, we have our missions that we're currently building, um, and those include uh, the Roman Space Telescope, which will uh, do a microlensing survey that completes our census of the uh, demographics of exoplanets in our own galaxy, uh, filling in uh, the hab the uh, habitable zone and out that was uh, not well accessible by Kepler or test or test, um, and then a, a great um, a portfolio of very small missions, uh, including Pandora. Uh, so a small set that will be studying uh, exoplanets in the next few years. Uh, you know, we are um, uh, after one of the uh, three areas of astrophysics. Uh, Theme areas is the exploration of one of the three areas of astrophysics is the exploration of exoplanets. Uh, we recently uh, announced the 5,000th confirmed exoplanet, uh, and uh, these are the percentages of the exoplanets in the catalog at the uh, NASA uh, Exoplanet Science Institute at uh, JPL. At, sorry, at Caltech, um, and the URL is there at the bottom. Uh, and you can see that, uh, that it's easiest to find the gas giant and the Neptune-like ones, but that they don't uh, make up the bulk of the, uh, of the exoplanets when you correct for uh, observational biases. In fact, uh, super-Earths and terrestrials 
uh, make up a, a large, much larger fraction, and those are the ones we're very interested in, as they represent the uh, best places to search for life as we know it. Paul, uh, we're not the James seeing. Space Pulse, we're not seeing your pie chart. Um, we're still seeing that first electromagnetic spectrum slide. What do you see now? James Webb. Okay, I'm going to stay like this. Okay, thank you. Here's the pie chart in case you missed it. You can see it online. Uh, and here was, my, here was my portfolio of missions, which you apparently also didn't see. So let's go on. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched on Christmas Day uh, last year. Uh, here is the last picture that we'll ever have of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this is a uh, uh, picture taken from the uh, rocket booster uh, as the James Webb Space Telescope is heading out into space. Um, we have... Uh, brought the web telescope into full focus. We've completed commissioning the telescope. Uh, and you can see here all four instruments, uh, as well as the fine guidance sensor, uh, are in focus. Um, uh, and these are sample images taken through each of the imagers on board the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, of course, works in the near infrared and the mid-infrared. Here is a picture on the right. Uh, of uh, uh, a field in the large Magellanic cloud taken with the mid-infrared instrument on James Webb compared to the same field taken with the uh, Spitzer infrared camera. Uh, and you can see uh, the uh, great, at the same wavelength, you can see the, the factor of 10 improvement in uh, spatial resolution that we realize with James Webb. And you can imagine uh, how much great science you're going to get because you can resolve all of those fainter sources in the image at the right that are completely invisible. In the image at the left. Uh, right now, we are commissioning the science instruments. Uh, that's the purple bar uh, at the right there. Um, and uh, we're about a quarter of the way through it. Um, and uh, there are 17 observing modes amongst the four science instruments on James Webb. And we will be commissioning all 17 of them uh, between now and the end of June. Uh, and uh, once we complete the commissioning, after about six months after launch, uh, about the end of June, uh, then we will be ready to start uh, science with uh, James Webb. We'll release the um, some early release uh, observations, and we'll be begin the the uh, cycle one science, which includes uh, uh, guest observers, guaranteed time observers, and early release science. Uh, if you want to follow along with James Webb, we've got a, couple, a bunch of interesting places. The blog, the blog is updated weekly with what's happening in the commissioning that week. Uh, and then the Where is Web provides a lot of visual tools for uh, seeing uh, where we're at in the commissioning of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, the great observatory to follow James Webb will be the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Uh, it is uh, in uh, phase C right now, which is the, uh, the critical design and fabrication phase. Uh, we uh, will be uh, completing uh, manufacturing of uh, pretty much all the parts of Nancy Grace Roman by uh, next year. Uh, and then we will be fully into the integration and test part. We're on track for a launch in May of 2027. Um, and uh, Nancy Grace Roman is a wide field telescope with the sensitivity of Hubble, about 100 times the field of view, which will allow us to do uh, fabulous surveys. Um, and of interest to uh, the astrobiology community uh, might be the surveys for uh, microlensing discovery of exoplanets, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but also uh, other kinds of time domain surveys with its wide field of view. Um, it's an excellent time domain uh, uh, instrument. So we just received, as Sean mentioned, the new decadal survey for, uh, uh, for astrophysics, and I'll talk a little bit about what our implementation of it. Uh, but just want to remind you that even though we received it uh, back in November, which is uh, all of six months ago, uh, we are executing right now a budget that was formulated two years ago, and it won't be until 2024 that we are form that we are executing a budget that was fully formulated after the Decatur survey was received. Uh, and so this is a feature of the federal budgeting process uh, that there that it takes us time to uh, make changes in our plans, but we are um, making those plans right now. So this is an exciting and ambitious plan for the next decade. 
Um, it makes recommendations across the breadth of astrophysics, uh, and uh, its new large initiative uh, is a, um, a program of future great observatories that includes a um, infrared optical ultraviolet uh, telescope that is optimized for characterizing exoplanets around nearby stars followed by a X-ray and a far infrared great observatory. The, the Cato survey did make recommendations on how we can improve uh, our, uh, the diversity of our community, the inclusiveness of our community. Um, these are really important uh, as we look forward to, this, uh, to executing this ambitious uh, decadal survey. Uh, the Decatur survey stated that uh, the pursuit of the science and the scientific excellence that we are targeting with this Decatur survey cannot be separated from the scientists who animate it. And so we must make sure that we are including everybody in our program. Uh, um, and that is something that NASA is doing. All of our programs and projects incorporate um, diversity and inclusion initiatives and all of the Decatur Survey initiatives that we will implement will incorporate uh, those values as well. And I'll take questions on that later. Um, the Decatur Survey said that before you start your next great observatory, you really need to make sure you're ready to start it. Um, and uh, they are exactly right. And in fact, in parallel with this Decatur Survey being done, NASA conducted its own study of uh, past large missions, including uh, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, Mars Rovers, Europa Clipper, um, all of our large missions, uh, to figure out what could we do to, uh, to uh, better perform once we've set our cost and schedule for the missions. And uh, we found uh, 10 things that we can do better at NASA, and we've incorporated those into our plans, and they mostly have to do with uh, doing more work up front than we had previously done in the past. In the past, there was a lot of emphasis on maturing your technologies before you start. And by what we've learned is that it's, it's not enough to mature your technology. You also have to mature your architecture and, and your science requirements. And you have to do all three of those in concert with each other uh, because uh, picking things that are doable in one area might uh, put you into places that are very difficult in the other. Um, an example is the James Webb Space Telescope. We did mature all the technologies early, but what we didn't look at early enough was how hard it was going to be to, um, to uh, manufacture uh, all the parts it takes and how hard it was going to be to integrate them and how hard it was going to be to test them. And all of those areas were harder than we had anticipated, uh, which contributed to why it took so long to realize James Webb. Uh, with Roman, we looked at all those earlier, and Roman remains within the cost that we set back at the very beginning of the project. Um, and uh, the Decadal Survey recommended that we do the same uh, uh, in parallel with NASA's own. And you can see uh, that the Decadal Survey recommended a subset of some of the cha changes that we had already put on ourselves at NASA. So we're going to implement the program of future great observatories that the Decato survey recommended. Uh, but right now, uh, our focus is on uh, completing the commissioning of James Webb and making sure that we uh, successfully begin its science program, and also completing the Roman Space Telescope and launching it within the cost and schedule commitments that we made at the beginning, demonstrating that NASA does know how to manage large missions uh, within our cost commitments. Uh, and so we're not going to start that next great observatory right now. We're going to get ready to start it. Uh, we, we, we foresee a three-stage program over the next um, uh, five or seven years, uh, where stage one is what we're doing right now, where we're, in, we're focusing on the sci enabling science and technology that it will take to do that uh, exoplanet mission. Uh, in stage two, uh, we'll begin the uh, maturation program recommended by the Decadal Survey, uh, by doing analysis alternatives and beginning the trade. Uh, and then stage three is when we'll move into a more uh, standard NASA pre-formulation where we identify a study office uh, and begin the process of getting ready to start a great observatory. Uh, in stage one, uh, we've got a lot of activities going on uh, that involve the community as well as NASA. 
Um, we are uh, conducting a lot of outreach to the community in science. We've already had our, our first workshop and some joint uh, program analysis group meetings. We've got another workshop coming up. Um, we are setting up uh, processes for um, assessing uh, which science requirements uh, drive the cost um, and which science requirements don't drive the cost so that we can uh, do a better job of setting science requirements that can actually be built within the um, time and cost that we intend to allocate to this next rate observatory. And of course, we are updating our technology priorities and our technology gap lists uh, so that we can uh, be maturing the tall pole technologies for the next great observatory. Um, and uh, we continue to uh, provide funding to the community. Um, uh, there's uh, all the Cato surveys, both the astrophysics and the planetary science, the Cato survey, uh, pay attention to uh, making sure that we're supporting the community to realize the benefits of the money that we spend on the mission. Uh, we are continuing to grow our support to the uh, astrophysics community. Uh, you can see through this uh, sand chart uh, that uh, um, we have been growing uh, both uh, research portfolio and the technology portfolio over the years, and now with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope in the beginning of this uh, general observer program, uh, we'll be growing that part of our uh, community support as well. Um, and uh, uh, the blue line shows what fraction of the total astrophysics budget uh, gets sent out directly to the community through grants and grant-like obligations, uh, and you can see that it has... Uh, has uh, always been uh, between 10 and 15 percent, and with the launch of James Webb, it will be approaching 20 percent in the years ahead. Now, um, the next observatory is going to be an astrobiology mission. Uh, the Decadal Survey recommended that we realize a mission that can search for biosignatures from our 25 habitable zone planets. Um, and uh, um, they said also be a potential facility for general astrophysics. The challenge of characterizing 25 habitable zone planets uh, requires a large telescope with incredible capabilities, uh, both in optics and instrumentation. And uh, if we build such a telescope, um, it will have the capabilities of doing transformative astrophysics in every possible area of astrophysics. Uh, and so that is the goal that we have. Um, and as I mentioned right now, we are beginning uh, stage one, which is the enabling science and the technology maturation uh, to allow us to move into the uh, stage two where we'll do the trade study. So uh, uh, this is what our fleet looks like right now. Um, and the Decatur Survey has recommended missions in the future, and we'll, we'll be excited to get them going. Uh, and with that, I'm going to, uh, Sean, I think we're going to do all the talks without taking questions. Is that correct? Yeah, I think we'll save questions and community feedback for the end. Um, and Eric, you're going to have okay. Paul continue to share slides. Is that correct? I'm, or, I'm, I'm speaking right. So, yeah. So okay, I now introduce Eric Mamajek, who is the deputy program chief scientist for the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program out at JPL. JPL. Eric. Uh, thank you. Paul's already introduced me, um, so I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, Paul, I think you need to advance. There we go. <laughs> um, so this is a, my one slide encapsulated the, the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program. Let me take my mask off here. Um, you know, the, the 20, if you think back, the 2010 decadal was excited about the search for life around nearby planets um, and uh, 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 building a large telescope to uh, search them with reflected light. But it said, we're not quite there yet. Um, they said, we need to advance the science. We need to advance the technology. We don't know how many Earth-like planets are out there, how much dust there is around nearby stars. Uh, the starlight suppression technologies and other technologies are not quite there yet. So why don't you go back and do a plan over the 20 teens? And that's really been the focus of the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program the last decade. And it's great to see that these, the advances in the science and technology over the last decade got us to the point where the, the 2020 decadal was, was ready to uh, 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 select and, and, and go forward with a, uh, a direct imaging mission. Um, so we've been, uh, the, the Exoplanet Program Office has been uh, involved with uh, uh, working with the community on uh, some of the mission concepts, um, uh, including uh, HAVEX and, and uh, LUVAR and, and, uh, a few years back, um, and now going forward with some of the uh, 
studies that will be uh, taking place with the, uh, uh, the new decadal missions. Um, the exoplanet program, if you've seen, you know, if you've seen any of the exoplanet uh, uh, travel bureau posters, if you've attended a Sagan workshop, uh, if you've applied for uh, some of the ground-based time through uh, uh, a CAC or the NN Explore program, those are those are parts of the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program where we're uh, helping to sustain the uh, uh, the exoplanet community, and also we work closely with the uh, uh, the ExoPag, the Program Analysis Group. Um, we have uh, the technology uh, and and science gap list. We've been thinking about um, you know hoping that a, a mission something like this to Cato six meter, um, you know we're anticipating that. Um, the, uh, the uh, technology gap lists have been quite mature. Um, we've had input from the large mission studies. Um, and on the science side, we had the benefit of the 2018 um, uh, exoplanet science strategy. So really, once the, the 2020 decadal came out, we're in, we're in pretty good shape. Um, uh, we've, we've already been uh, uh, moving in, in terms of science and technology uh, in that direction. Uh, so OK, so that's enough on the exoplanet program. Next slide. I just want to circle back to Paul's slide uh, and just think a little bit about the community interface um, with this, this stage one process. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to reiterate the, uh, um, that this, there is time for a community input on uh, thinking about the precursor science for the decadal six meter. Um, and uh, the, the first workshop was in uh, late April. The next one will either be in uh, late July or uh, early August. Um, and we're working with the community to try to find what the, what the key science gaps are that should be known that, will, that are uh, su sufficiently important to inform the design um, of the, um, uh, the future flagships. Um, and these workshops are for all, uh, for all three, the FAR IR, X-ray, and the uh, IRO UV. Um, there's the uh, Exocet, the science evaluation team, and this is, this is another group that will have um, uh, an interface with the PAGs. Um, and uh, on the technology side, we'll have um, uh, an updated technology gap list and, and the community will be able to propose through the, the um, uh, Strategic Astrophysics Technology Program uh, to, to advance uh, uh, technologies relevant to the decadal. Again, those, and even the changes to that gap list was not all that big because we already had the input from, the, um, from these mission studies going into the 2020 decadal. So there was, there was no, no major surprises. Next slide. I want to advertise ExoPag 26, or the Exoplanet uh, uh, Program Analysis Group uh, holds meetings twice a year. They're usually timed around, they're, they're always around a winter AAS. Uh, during the summer, they're either around a, a science uh, uh, topical meeting or a, a summer AAS. In this case, it's, uh, uh, it'll be scheduled right before the, uh, the Pasadena uh, 240th American Astronomical Society meeting. Um, the agenda to that is quickly coming together now, uh, but I encourage you to reach out to members of the ExoPag um, uh, if you have uh, particular items uh, about, uh, uh, that you'd like to see discussed. Um, so I, uh, I also encourage you, if you're not already on the ExoPag email list, to, pre, uh, to please sign up. Um, we, only, we send those out about every week or two with, with uh, 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 updates relevant to the, uh, uh, to the ExoPag. With that, I'd like to introduce Michael Meyer, who is the ExoPag chair, and hopefully he was able to join. Oh, good, I see his face. Okay. Michael Meyer is a professor at University of Michigan, and he is our, uh, he's been our ExoPag uh, uh, chair the last, uh, the last couple of years. Uh, Michael, are you, is your audio functioning? Now it should be. Thanks, awesome. Eric. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me. So uh, what a great segue into just a couple of charts to tell you what about the ExoPag uh, and what we're thinking about. <clears throat> and let me advance. So this is the uh, executive committee that Eric was uh, obliquely alluding to. Uh, these are the people you can uh, contact if you have ideas or suggestions. This is not a, a, a strong, closed leadership group, it's simply a coordinating body for what is the ExoPag, which is everybody. It's anyone who's interested in the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program, which I think must include everyone who can hear me right now. So you're all a member, whether you knew it or not, of the ExoPag. Um, we have some new members who've joined the EC, and we are very grateful for their service, as well as those who are rotating off. Uh, Diana Dragomir uh, from the University of New Mexico, Aaron May, 
uh, from JHU Applied Physics Lab, Bertrand Menison from uh, JPL, and John Winzinowicz uh, from the University of Oklahoma. So thanks to all of them. I'll point out that the ExoPAG is an interdisciplinary uh, group. We are within the NASA Astrophysics Division, but we do have observers and liaisons from other NASA divisions because of the nature, the interdisciplinary nature of the field. Um, you've heard this term, I think, thrown out about SIGs and SAGs. A SIG is a science interest group, which is meant to be a longer term activity of some number of years, that is uh, working issues and providing analyses for NASA. We are not an advisory group, so we don't advise NASA, but we perform analyses and generate findings which go into the uh, NASA leadership and they use that in their decision-making process. So SIGs are one mechanism where we can do those analyses. SAGs are another. Those are science analysis groups. And the difference is that the SAGs are meant to be short-term, more focused activities with a specific report or uh, some output product which is generated and then handed to the astrophysics division leadership, uh, in this case, Paul, uh, for his consumption. So we've just closed out two SAGs, which some of you, many of you in the room have probably participated in. They were very large efforts by many, many people and extremely valuable, we think, uh, to the community. So thank you all for your efforts on stellar contamination on transit spectra and exoplanet host properties. We've just launched a new SAG, uh, led by John Debus and a couple of colleagues on debris disk properties and exozodes of exoplanet host stars. So that is one ongoing analysis, which will hopefully be useful in this context. And the two SIGs are exoplanet demographics, which is an ongoing topic, uh, updating the SAD-13 uh, uh, Eta Earth uh, focused initiative. And of course, as many of you know in the room that Exoplanets and solar system exploration are two uh, things that have a lot of synergies uh, together, and Vicki Meadows and, and Kathy Mant lead that science interest group. There are links at the bottom of this. I don't know if we can make these charts available, but people can go and learn about the work of the SIGs and SAGs there. But the real topic today is what can the Exopag contribute to uh, the topic of this um, uh, town hall? And we're already doing some things. Uh, we're supporting what we hope will be uh, cross PAG science analysis groups, these shorter term things on studying and understanding the value of uh, numerous great observatories that could work in concert like our previous generation of the observatories did. There, we also hope to participate in uh, new efforts to understand barriers to participation by underrepresented groups in space science. And of course, we're supporting the precursor science workshops, which I hope many of you participated in and others will join, as Eric said, for the July workshop. What else can we do? Well, this is just one idea, and you may have others that are better than this, but uh, we've been discussing the possibility of creating a new science interest group. It would again be a cross PAG, meaning that we would have representatives from FISPAG and COPAG on it, as well as several uh, leaders from the EXOPAG. Perhaps we would spin up a science interest group on this topic of uh, the phase one uh, precursor activities in science and technology for the future large aperture UV optical IR space telescope. And this would really be to support the process that Paul and others have outlined, uh, the GOMAP phase one. We think this could be led by the ExoPAG, but we would definitely need to have, we think, representatives from the other PAGs because a great observatory, uh, something like we're talking about, would serve a large fraction of the astrophysics community. This group would uh, maybe have subgroups then that would spin off and create analyses on specific topics, perhaps issue findings or reports on specific topics, but it would be an ongoing thing through this very, very important phase one uh, set of activities. So I just throw out a couple of questions that I'm personally interested in. What would instrumentation targeted at exoplanet diversity, not necessarily a specific focus on habitability, but, but atmospheric characterization of the diversity, would that be any different or not? It's not obvious that it would. And as has been talked about by many members of the community here, how much do we understand the range of habitability? Is it a big enough picture? Is it broad enough and diverse enough? Um, I wanna say that anything that, that such a group would do would not be done in a vacuum and reinventing the wheel. Of course, there's a huge amount of effort by expert who know more about specific topics than many others of us, myself, um, on the concept studies. And so we would try to take advantage of all that as well as the existing uh, and ongoing activities 
uh, that are, for example, happening in Nexus. The quantitative habit habitability group, for example, has already studied some of these issues. So we would not repeat what has already been done. I am personally not exactly sure how such a group would interface uh, and report out to APD. I mean, we could always send uh, reports to Paul, uh, but how would we interface with this SST, TST, and SET, the science, the technology, and the evaluation group that Eric uh, mentioned again and Paul showed earlier? So we'd have to figure out how such a group would interact with them. And if some people I know in the community are very anxious to get started doing something, to have a mechanism for the community to have input here, and if we wanted to do something quick, we would have to try to get a term of reference put together and approved, uh, or at least viewed by the APAC and approved by uh, the leadership sometime this summer. And the next opportunity to do that at the APAC would be July 19 through 21. But let me just say, none of this is set in stone. These are just ideas. And as Eric said, we're having ExoPAC 26 coming up. And it's really what you want. What do you think we should do? And we are, are your servants here and coordinators to try to implement what you think would be best for the community to participate in the phase one uh, of this activity. And that's all. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Michael and Eric and Paul. Um, our last speaker before we go to community discussion is Victoria Meadows from the University of Washington, also a co-lead for the Nexus for Exoplanet System Science, or Nexus, one of the Astrobiology Program's research coordination networks, and she'll talk about that group's potential activities. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Let's see. Let's see how this works. <laughs> it's been 50-50. Okay, cool. All right. So um, I am representing my co-leads here in Nexus, and I just want to talk a little bit about what Nexus is and what we've done in the past to give you some inspiration of what we could do um, as far as precursor science and supporting the astrobiology initiatives in the decadal. So um, Nexus is NASA's Nexus for Exoplanet System Science, and so we are working together to find life uh, beyond the solar system. What do we mean by system science? Well, we recognize that, you know, to have a habitable planet, uh, it takes a lot of characteristics and a lot of processes, and those are not just intrinsic to the planet itself, which you can see in the bottom panel. It's not just what happened to the planet, how it formed, evolved, its characteristics now. It's also how it interacts with its star, uh, and also how it interacts with other planets and other um, objects in its planetary system. And so for a planet to be able to acquire, maintain, um, and even lose habitability, it all comes down to um, these interactions between these three major components, planet, uh, star, and planetary system. So that is taking a systems uh, science approach to, to understanding habitability. So to do that, it's obviously very clearly on this diagram, massively interdisciplinary. We're getting you know, lots and lots of different fields, geology, biology, atmospheric sciences, um, astronomy, um, all working together. And so to do that, um, it's important to have a, a collaborative network that will allow these disciplines to interact um, and work together more efficiently on answering one of humanity's oldest questions, which is, of course, are we alone? So... Um, Here's sort of an articulation of Nexus science goals. Um, and these were written a while ago, but actually they're very well aligned with what recently came out in the decadal survey. So that's, that's good. We're all running in parallel here. So uh, in Nexus, uh, what our groups are trying to do by, by doing that interdisciplinary interaction is to understand planets in context throughout their formation and co-evolution with their parent star and planetary system. To investigate the diversity of exoplanet characteristics and learn how their properties and evolution can create the conditions for life to understand how to identify the best exoplanet targets for life searchers, and to learn how to recognize and search for signs of habitability and life on exoplanets. So it's a pretty broad scope um, covered under uh, Nexus Science. So those incredibly broad goals require, again, massive interdisciplinarity. So the other thing that Nexus does um, is it, it tries to address the complexity of, of these science questions uh, by leveraging NASA-funded research across the four NASA science divisions. So for those of you who don't know, that's planetary science, astrophysics, heliophysics, and Earth science. And all of these divisions have scientists um, and science that is relevant to answering these bigger questions. So what is Nexus then? 
Uh, it's, a, it's many things, there's so some, some definitions, but, but I'll just go through some of the, the standard ones. So this is an interdisciplinary research coordination network founded in 2015 and dedicated to the study of planetary habitability and the search for life on exoplanets. It's also a cross-division initiative, bringing astrophysicists, planetary scientists, earth scientists, and heliophysics together to bring a system science approach to the problem. It's also a way to leverage NASA investments in research and missions to create a community that will accelerate discovery and characterization of potentially life-bearing worlds and break down barriers between SMD divisions. So that's, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. So we have headquarters reps from, from all of these different uh, divisions, uh, and the co-leads are listed there, and you can see all our photos on the bottom there. Um, and we are also one of five what's called research coordination networks. So NASA has um, five research coordination networks that incorporate the larger teams that are funded under the, the ICAR for interdisciplinary astrobiology research. Um, we're currently running, or as of a few months ago, at about 410 members with 66 teams spanning 114 institutions in 15 countries. So it is a very large uh, collaboration. Currently, about 90% of us are from the US, and we have 10% international participation. And uh, Daniel Apai, one of the co-leads, found this number two, just searching on ADS. We have 377 papers that actually acknowledge Nexus um, so far as being part of uh, what helps that paper to be published. Okay, so here's some example Nexus activities, um, and I'm also going to go in more detail into things where we're, we're actually integrating science as well. So we can help coordinate community white paper activities, both in response to decadals and other calls, but also in response to science questions that we identify ourselves. And I think one of our, our most famous and impactful and highly cited white papers is in fact the one that was led by Jonathan Fortney on laboratory astrophysics that we needed to address our questions. Uh, in the past, we've had postdoc opportunities. We don't have any right now, um, but you know, watch this space. We have a whole slew of science working groups, and I'll talk about those in more detail on the next slide. Uh, we have infiltrated um, Habex and Louvoir, and we have helped out with science uh, with, in both the science study teams uh, and also the um, yeah, science technology and definition teams and the, the study teams for the missions. Uh, we hold workshops without walls, so these are virtual uh, conferences um, that we were doing long before virtual conferences became a thing. Um, and we also hold the Hab Worlds conferences, so these are specifically focused on habitable planets. Um, and we held one in person in 2017 and one completely virtually in 2021 for reasons I don't need to go into. Uh, we have a communication working group that works to communicate our science uh, with, to each other and to the general public, and also up to the NASA administration. So we have a group of people who will help you write science nuggets um, if you would like to do that. Uh, we uh, help sponsor student summer schools. We do webinars um, where we have different disciplines talking to each other. And we also have this fabulous new initiative led by Jessica Nobiello, uh, which is an early career professional development series that is run virtually. And so if you have early career people, please point them in the direction of pause. There's some fantastic um, uh, events as part of that. And we also have a public outreach, uh, manyworlds.space blog um, as well. So speaking specifically to the charge, you know, what Nexus activities, um, you know, can integrate teams, build community, and potentially address um, the astrobiology that's been outlined in this decadal survey. So we have, um, in the past, done a bunch of collaborative community observing proposals. Um, two of these are shown here. There's the James Webb Space Telescope uh, early release science proposal, which was spectacularly successful. Um, and that proposal was, was initiated within Nexus with Nexus scientists, but as a broad community activity that brought in other scientists as well. Um, and it will be studying stars in great detail to help inform um, things like noise levels and observing, you know, gotchas uh, for all future uh, exoplanet uh, observations and transmission. And so um, that is a, you know, a fabulous community service that's being done. We also have the Trampus one JWST Community Initiative, where a group of interdisciplinary scientists got together and uh, put in a whole bunch of proposals uh, for JWST time in the last round. Um, you know, but, but coordinating, helping each other, making sure we did noise analyses, sharing them amongst proposals, and just making it so much more efficient to actually propose for that particular target. Uh, we do workshops and reports. Um, the most recent one is the biosignature assessment framework, uh, which we talked about in a town hall earlier this week. Um, and that was a joint activity between the Nexus Research Coordination Network and the NFOLD Research Coordination Network, and that's the Network for Life Detection. 
uh, we have um, these fabulous 1D and 3D GCM model comparison workshops, and that's um, coming out of the, uh, the Cuisines uh, Climate Model into Comparison uh, Science Working Group. And you can see a bunch of their, uh, a bunch of their little logos here for their different uh, model comparison activities and their amazing backronyms, including things like Camembert and Malbec. And I don't know exactly what they stand for, but it, it makes sense. Okay, so, um, so we have those. So bringing the community together to compare models, to, to find bugs, to, to find things that need to be worked on to strengthen our models and, uh, you know, uh, get sort of more of a consensus on what we should be modeling. Uh, we've held work workshops on magnetic field effects on habitability, looking at star planet interactions, and also on the quantification of habitability, which is directly relevant to, to what we're talking about here. So we currently have six science working groups. Um, there's a planet formation group. Um, uh, the, so uh, Maitri A. Bose and uh, Sebastian Kreit are actually running that. I'm sorry, I've got old names here. These people have rolled off um, the leading and we have new, uh, new leaders at the moment. Uh, we have the multi-domain habitability assessment, the quantification group, which is led by Daniela Pai and Rory Barnes, who is here. Uh, we have a biosignatures group, Stephanie Olson, Avi Mandel, Technosignatures, Adam Frank and Jason Wright. Uh, and then this wonderful climate model into comparison uh, group, uh, which has done into comparisons for the Trappist system, as well as a bunch of other sort of standard comparisons. And that's Thomas Fache and Alinda Sol. Um, and then we have a planetary atmospheres and interiors connectivity group that's particularly interested in how interior processes uh, and also exterior loss processes affect um, the secondary atmospheres that you might get from terrestrial planets. So that's also potentially extremely relevant to the precursor science that we need uh, for these um, upcoming missions. Uh, we have a communications working group. Um, so um, there's sort of uh, inter-team, uh, you know, getting information out to, to the people within the, the Nexus collaboration, but also out to the general science community in HQ. As I said, science nuggets. Um, and the, you know, opportunities for knowledge exchange through these various uh, things like the publication bulletin. And we also have regular steering committee meetings of our principal investigators. So if you, when you, when you put in a proposal, if you check the box and say, I'd like to be part of Nexus if I'm selected, then you also become a member of our steering group as well. And so you can have a say in the activities that we take part in. Uh, we also have Slack workspace, uh, you know, with, with special channels for our working groups and our early career channels as well um, as our Nexus newsletter. Okay, so um, given all of these different activities, many of them relevant to, uh, to the, the charge here, uh, there are many, many ways to get involved in Nexus. Um, if you do get involved in Nexus, you get access to you know, our announcements, publication bulletins, newsletter, and Slack space. And of course, you'll get sort of first notification of all of these collaborative activities. But you can also propose collaborative activities. And in fact, you don't actually have to be in Nexus to do that. If you come to us and say, hey, I'd really like to hold this workshop you know, on, this, on this, this thing that's relevant, uh, we can help you actually find uh, the funding and uh, you know the the uh, the help that you need to to make that happen. So um, if you just want to you know dip your toe in the water, you don't have to apply for membership. But you can join one of our science working groups or participate in any of the workshops, conferences, or other community activities that we have there. Um, or you can join as a Nexus affiliate if you are not already a member of um, a Nexus team. And so if you go into the nexus.info website um, and look for the affiliate page, uh, you can apply there to do that. So um, for the decadal precursor activity specifically, um, we are going to, you know, we're not going to lay out exactly what you should do. What we love to, to hear is from you ideas, again, as, as uh, Mike also called for, what would you like to do? Um, and so we're going to encourage you to propose activities that align with the priorities recommended in the decadal and that could potentially support this pathway to habitable planets implementation. Um, and this could be via either, you know, participating in existing activities in the Nexus Science Working Groups, the Model into Comparisons, the habitable uh, quantification and habitability activities. Uh, you could suggest new topics of studies to those working groups, or you could even suggest a new science working group. That's perfectly fine, too. Um, you could organize a community conference on a key topic, and again, we will help you with the, sort of the twist proposal and everything we need to do to, to get funding for that. Um, and of course, you could develop community collaborations for any precursor observations in space or on the ground that you would like to get done. So on behalf of the co-leads uh, for Nexus and for the, the science working groups, I'd, we'd love to hear your ideas and to help you get the collaborations and the support you need for your activities. So, um, you know, please hunt us down. Uh, either after this or virtually, uh, and uh, ask about uh, the opportunities and getting involved.
Um, let's thank Vicki and all our speakers for just great things to come. Um, um, yeah, come on up. And then I think this is the place where we'd have questions, feedback on anything uh, we've heard so far, ideas for any of these groups. Clearly, there's a lot of ways for us to get involved as individuals and as a community. Um, but this is where we open up the floor to questions, feedback, thoughts, concerns, et cetera. Hi, this is Michelle Hill from UC Riverside. Um, that was great, Vicky. I just wanted to know um, all the workshops and everything from Nexus. Is there a website that lists everything that is going on? Um, yeah, if you go to the nexus.info website, um, it will list our current community collaborations and activities. Um, and yeah, and if you if you want to join as an affiliate, you'll get on the email list, and you know you'll get, you'll get sent reminders of those. But yeah, nexus.info has has listings of all our our current activities. Thank you. Any other ideas from folks or questions? Do we have one online or is that just no? note? Oh, Michael also put the nexus.info website for remote attendees, it looks like. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Michael, I'll ask you the same question we just heard. Um, is, there is a website, I believe, for the XEP, uh, I'm sorry, the XOPEG activities, correct? That's right. I had it in the charts, but I will put it in as well. So if you Google uh, NASA XOPEG, it will take you right to the first hit uh, right up. And I think Eric also had the links uh, on his charts. So I don't know, Sean, if you can make those available, but I'll certainly pop the XOPEG link in the chat. I, I believe we're being recorded, so if, you, uh, if, if you're in the audience here in person, you can, you can see the slides be replayed and also uh, the chat window replay. Another question in person. Hi, I'm Jacob Buckminster of Blue Marble Space. Uh, so the Astro 2020 uh, report made recommendations. How soon can we expect actual decisions to be made by NASA? So uh, budget our decision. Uh, we are currently formulating the uh, FY24 budget, um, and that is the first budget we have that will be fully informed by the decadal survey. Um, that budget will be submitted by the president to Congress in February of 2023, so next February. Um, that, that's the, that you asked when. Uh, let me draw your attention to the fact that the um, planning budget that NASA has been given, uh, which is the run out of the uh, FY23 request that was submitted to Congress uh, back at the end of March, is substantially lower for astrophysics, is substantially lower than the planning budget we had uh, a year previously. Um, and so we are replanning all of our out years uh, to a much lower planning budget than we had done uh, a year ago. Um, and this will have a, um, a noticeable impact on how quickly we can implement the recommendations of the Decatur survey. Uh, but I cannot, um, well, decisions haven't been made and we'll be able to talk about them publicly uh, next February. And, and Paul, just a follow-up question. You said that budget is submitted in December. I think that usually goes public later uh, in January to March of the following uh, year. The, 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 the federal government's uh, request for fiscal year 24 will be submitted to Congress in February of 2023. Um, between now and then, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on within the agency and the White House. Jacob, does that answer your question? Okay, great. You got a thumbs up, Paul, from the audience member. Yay. <laughs> Okay, um, other questions, last, last call. Not that we're in a hurry, but I also don't wanna, oh, we do have a question, great. Hi, Kim Bot, UC Riverside. Um, I might have just missed this on the slides or because I came in a little bit late, but uh, I know a lot of more junior people are very excited to get involved with these missions more. And I was wondering if any or all of you could expand a little bit on 
like the formal routes to do that. Obviously, one way to do that is to write like a relevant paper, but are there workshops or things like that coming up where people can like network as well? I, if it's okay, I'd like, I'd like each of the, the groups to respond to that question. Maybe Paul, do you wanna go first of ways early career members could get involved in these future recommended uh, flight activities? Yes, uh, glad to. So um, we are in the process of um, establishing some uh, uh, science and technology strategy teams, which will be uh, made up mostly of NASA people, but um, they will be coordinating uh, activities and uh, um, I've forgotten the words we're using, but uh, uh, community groups to uh, help address the topics that we need to address in order to plan the next uh, great observatory. Um, and these will be uh, fully advertised uh, within the community so that people can uh, join them and get involved in those. Um, we'll also be having opportunities for funding. Uh, we'll be issuing through ROSES calls for uh, precursor science investigations. And always, as always, our technology programs will be continuing, but now our priorities are focused on the technologies needed to implement the digital survey. Uh, so that's that's with regards to the next great observatory. Uh, we have a call for medium-sized mission astrophysics probes coming out, and I know that those teams are being assembled uh, because those are principal investigator-led teams. Uh, you'll have to contact the, the principal investigators. NASA doesn't do matchmaking uh, for those activities. Um, and then the Decadal Survey is going to be fully informing all of our research programs and our research priorities. So all of our ROSES elements that are being advertised this year um, the, the peer reviews will be peer reviewers will be fully informed about the decadal survey and Rose has already said that addressing decadal survey science priorities is one of the evaluation criteria. Uh, Eric, you wanna, do you wanna go next? I, I just wanna uh, again advertise the Exopag email list if, for the people that are not on it because there may be opportunities for some of these activities where they'll be interfacing with the PAGs. I think that's where you'll hear about um, the different opportunities and, and meetings being organized and such. Michael? I'll follow up Eric, and I totally agree with what he said. Uh, the easiest thing a young person can do to sort of get plugged in is to get on that email list, and then you'll review the opportunities as they come up. Some of them will interest you and others won't. Um, the other thing that we would really like to see a lot of young scientists participate in is the precursor science workshops. Uh, as was alluded to, the first one happened in April. There will be another one in July. And this is really a great opportunity because some of the best and most knowledgeable and wisest uh, instrumentalists that have worked on NASA missions for decades will be there trying to lead conversations of others with less experience and trying to help people figure out what's useful to do now and start thinking about things for the future. So it's really a great opportunity. Um, we always worry about trying to get young people to do too much service for free. Uh, older folks should share that shoulder, that burden, but there are really great opportunities and we're, you know, you guys are the future. So these will be your observatories. And so I think it's really important to get the young people involved in these preparatory activities. Vicki? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, in the, in the, again, I will, I will absolutely endorse getting on the ExoPag mailing list. That's really important because you will see these specific sort of mission, uh, you know, focused uh, activities come up for community involvement. So that's important. Um, and then also, you know, again, to just stay plugged into the community that's working on these science problems, I would encourage you to apply to join Nexus. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to be a member of a team if you're interested in, in hearing about the activities that we're working on. Um, and of course, we specifically have um, a, uh, a channel for early career uh, people in Nexus and also the pause activity. And if you come into Nexus, you can you can potentially ask for the, the professional development activity to also talk about these particular questions. We could even have a special session on that um, about how you get involved. So I think, you know, that there's also summer schools. I know JPL runs one specifically um, to, uh, you know, to sort of train you and in, in mission involvement. But really, you know, the way I got into missions initially was, you know, just getting into that community Community, getting into the relevant science and keeping your ear to the ground on, uh, you know, being able to come up with some of these particular um, activities. And also, I mean, within Nexus, you can initiate activities. You can start your own, you know, collaborative group or, uh, you know, or even uh, propose activities and we can support you with that. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you all. Um, and just to add to this, uh, I'd also just encourage each individual member of our community 
um, to take a look at the section of the of the decadal survey that Paul referenced in his uh, in his talk earlier on diversity, equity, inclusivity, uh, and accessibility, um, because it's it's our responsibility to meet all the astrophysics decadal recommendations, including those on DEIA issues. Um, so please take a look at that and make sure along uh, career lines in terms of uh, early versus late career, but also other demographic factors that we're doing what was uh, what we were recommended to do. And that goes across all the activities. Hold our feet to the fire on that. Um, other questions, thoughts? Sean, if I could just, oh, yeah. go ahead. I was just saying, Mike has his hand raised. Go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say at the Exopac 26 that Eric already advertised, we're having a kind of mini symposium on the state of the profession to try to address exactly some of the issues you were just raising. Wonderful. Thank you. Don, was there something you were going to add to that? No, I was just going to make sure that Michael was recognized as oh. wanting to say something. Thank you. Yes. One short thing. I just want to say to the early career people, the other thing is please reach out to us. Uh, it is great going to these meetings and just uh, just coming up to some of the you know mid career senior career people. Tell you know introduce yourself. Tell us about your research. Show me your poster. Um, and uh, it, it's it's great to hear what you're working on. And it's great to um, you know some of us are also thinking. Oh, did you think of going you know thinking about this? This sounds really relevant to um, you know these uh, these decadal priorities and these funding opportunities. So uh, please reach out to the. Uh, uh, the, the, the folks you see here, Exopag, Nexus, um, uh, members of NASA. Thanks. Thanks, Polly Branch, NASA headquarters. Um, I also just wanted to plug the PI Launchpad as another yes. uh, great opportunity to learn more about um, how to get involved in missions and how to propose missions. Um, that's a cross SMD. Um, um, I also had a question for Vicky. I wanted to ask um, in terms of uh, your Nexus membership, uh, you know, here at AppSecPon, right, there's such a diversity of uh, science disciplines. And I wondered if you feel like um, there's any particular science disciplines you'd love to see more involved in Nexus. Heliophysics. We would love to have more heliophysics people involved. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's probably yeah. our, our, our identified biggest issue. Also, also more uh, card-carrying our scientists, we'd like to get them more involved. And we've definitely got a very good access going with astrophysics and planetary science, but it's those other two um, divisions that, I mean, we do have participation, but we'd like to boost it up a bit. So yeah, heliophysics and, and earth scientists. Great, thanks so much. Okay. Last chance. Now we really are almost up at the deadline, but we still have time for one or two questions or, or thoughts if there are more. Okay, um, let's thank all our speakers one more time. Uh, and uh, I guess this town hall's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>